There's something funny about the idea of unknowing, presumption, assumption. The fact that you can base a whole mentality around a falsity is something beyond fascinating to me, both in the banality of the mundanity or right in the upper echelon of extremity. No matter the scale or who it involves, the concept is one that tickles me and makes up a degree of content I enjoy, such as the documentaries that Oki produces for his Weird Stories channel on YouTube. Secret space programs to grace rights. Of course, the topic doesn't limit itself to real life. A number of stories rely upon unreliability on a character's part or the examination of a disconnected thought process. One of those stories took me almost five months to make a video on. But what is the point in all this faffing about? I thought One Finger Death Punch was much shorter than it seemed. That's the joke. Funny how Total Biscuits, R.I.P., video framed the game in my head as a short experience when, in total, my recording time was nearing the double digits. Goes to show you how looks can be deceiving. So, anyway, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and share the video around. Or... Don't. I ain't your Uncle Aiden who will take a circuitous route to achieve his revenge on your killers and then somehow become a reoccurring character for side content. <laughs>I think when most people see the Silver Dollar Games logo, a wafting odor of cheapest chips and get what you pay for hits their nostrils like the decaying carcass of some forgotten creature, not just lost to time, but lost to the evolutionary chart. Silver Dollar Games. What a couple of hack frauds that shovel shit. Specifically, shoveling shit onto the Xbox Live Indie Arcade back in the day where I would assume most of you know them from. Rage Quits Michael Jones had a belter trying to keep Luca from eating his cereal, while super great friend tongue-in-cheekly lambasted the Legend of Bloody Mary by converting it into an eSport. Drag is a mighty popular insult to throw around, the medium as a whole coming together to essentially label Silver Dollar the witch to be burned at the stake for poisoning the waterhole. The concept of indie titles and what it means to go without a publisher. Yet, I think this represents a lack of awareness when coming to grips with outsider art. Outsider art lies in a temporally complicated mind space, both as an accepted term and as a discussed talking point. No joke, going to Google the phrase led to page upon page of critique, admonishment, explanation, support, and every kind of debate you can think of. Some view it as woefully misleading or generalizing to a laughable degree, while others find it a fraud much in the same way that modern slash postmodern slash contemporary art has had that guillotine over its head for however many years. And before you say anything, the signed urinal, Fountain, was a 1917 submission as both critique and protest, and it's still being talked about today. Bottom line is, Art with a capital A is a rarely agreed upon subject and is subjective to its core. At least when money laundering isn't involved. To cut to the chase, my personal definition of outsider art is someone who has had no experience or professional background in an industry making something that said industry makes. You're Neil Breen's for a shorthand as his whole career before his dip into movies was with real estate. Not counting for quality or if outsider artists can break from that identifier with enough time, success, or advancement, but that is an entirely whole different 
tangent besides. Like, if Neil Breen made good movies after his first few, I know this airs closer to the hobbyist term, and to be frank, that's how I sort of take outsider art as a tag, just with less knowledge on the topic. For example, I wouldn't be an outside artist if I decided to help make a movie. I have a background in video editing. If I went to make architectural sketches, however, that would be outsider art, as I know nothing about the subject and would have to learn as I went along. Then, with enough growth, understanding, or whatever, I wouldn't be an outsider artist anymore, as I would have gained experience in the medium. <laughs> Loquacious introduction done, Jonathan and David Fluke, the two brothers that are Silver Dollar Games. Their background has absolutely nothing to do with video games outside of playing them. Recounted by John in a press release covered by Paul Franzen of Game Cola is this. I'm John Fluke and my brother is David. We make video games for Xbox indie games, although you wouldn't guess it by looking at our past. We have no programming experience and no formal artistic or computer skills of any kind. We're just a couple of hacks making games because it's fun. In 2007, David was working at a grocery store and I was working at a TV station. David took programming in high school, but never really explored it past that. When he heard about XNA, he started learning it immediately. No technical school. No mentorship. Only the glow of a monitor and nights of wow as the teachers and the daytime jobs eating into development. Yet with all those pressures, David, and John when he had the time, got to working on and completed the duo's first ever game, Blazing Birds a funky little badminton title involving robots that won the Microsoft Dream Build Play Contest in 2007. A uh, little note, this was the inaugural run of the event for Microsoft, which would persist for almost 10 years more, and some of the other notable winners include the likes of The Dishwasher Dead Samurai, which tied with Blazing Birds that first year, and 2009 Top 4 member Dust and Elysian Tale. Impressed by their performance, the brothers went ahead with developing their next title, the Bubble Blowing Adventure Blow, for the 2008 competition, as David was in talks with Microsoft to get Blazing Birds published on the Xbox Live Arcade. That wouldn't happen until 2009, after Blow's top 20 placement in Dream Build Play 2008 and subsequent position on the initial lineup for X-Plig, Xbox Live Indie Games. Yet, both games play an utmost important role in shaping the brothers' burgeoning career as indie developers. With Blow, the cost-to-value ratio is made apparent, and going back to the press release has John state, for months there was no sales data for developers on indie games. Only Microsoft knew how well everyone was doing. Finally, in March of 2009, the sales data became accessible to the developers. We looked at our numbers, and Blow brought in $4,000. For most indie games, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, we spent $2,500 licensing the music and a year of our time working on it. Financially, it just didn't make sense. We're still very proud of Blow, and it's one of my favorite games, but I guess the gamers just weren't into blowing bubbles. Can't blame them. For Blazing Birds, it was reception. On May 20th, 2009, Blazing Birds was released for Xbox Live Arcade. Did I mention Blazing Birds is about robot badminton? One reviewer wrote, be careful what you wish for, in reference to winning the 2007 Dream Build Play Contest and all of Blazing Birds' faults. Although I must say it was, and still is, a dream come true. It wasn't a great game by any means. It had no online play, along with many other things. It was missing many features for one simple reason. My brother just didn't know how to do it or couldn't do it well enough. Plain and simple, he's just not as skilled as the Jonathan Blows or the James Silvas of the world. That's okay for a complete amateur. I think he did okay. Unfortunately, the Xbox users aren't too hot on robot badminton. So for 
many reasons, the game didn't do too well. Forming around these two games would be the core of Silver Dollar, making games for fun and because you can. Titles like Load, Shooter Date, or Fortune Cookies in Bed, a selection of a multitude of titles the Brothers Fluke would put onto Xblig, weren't created as a financial venture or because the two are hack frauds. Far from the sort. The two are using to full advantage the concept of Xblig as a marketplace for any independent idea. A concept originally stemming from the Apple App Store's limited restrictions on development. Back to John, some developers feel that Xblig is different from Apple's App Store because the App Store has no other market to compete with, whereas Xblig's has Xbla right around the corner. It's easier for customers to bypass Xblig's altogether. I believe that's exactly why Crisis Nuclear Holocaust, Murder on Snake Road, and The Secret to the Perfect Pickup Line can shine on Xblig's. You can't go to PSN, Steam, or Xbla for titles like this. In fact, if you want to make a great shooting games on Xblig's, be ready to compete with Geometry Wars and Assault Heroes. If you want to make an RPG, get ready to compete with Torchlight and Costume Quest. If you want to make Mirror, Ranger, or Blow, get ready to compete with no one but yourself. I feel the reason Xblig's only competes with Xbla is because we allow it to do so by trying to mimic what's already been done. My brother has always said, if you can't do it better, do it different. Funny how Steam wound up with the green light idea, and if I may interject, of course anyone with dubious intentions will take advantage of the system held by these marketplaces. That doesn't mean you should punish everyone for a few bad apples. In the immortal words of Jay Ballman, twisted for the relevancy of the topic, anyone can make a game, and a game can be about anything. And ultimately, the flukes make games for the simple reason of having fun, which is a mindset I can relate to. Don't I make these videos to have fun? Relation, the reason for why Shooter Date and Fortune Cookies were made was because of family get-togethers the brothers were at where a member said an off-the-cuff statement that John or David latched onto as a neat or fun idea to turn into a game. It's this paragraph from John that sums up the mentality of Silver Dollar. There are few people on Xblig's that have had enough success to work on it full time. Many make it big with one title and are still riding that wave. Others have made it big with multiple titles. We don't make games for money. Our game Help Fight Breast Cancer is an example of that. It turns out if you just work really hard all day and all night, you make enough to get by. We make games like Mind Warp and Drop Zone because it's fun to make games. But yes, we have been doing it for three years and are probably one of the more experienced people when it comes to the Xblig market. My advice to anyone looking to get into Xblig is just have fun. Oh right, uh, one figure death punch. Uh, yeah, there isn't much here as it too was a dream build play entrant, John and David putting greater time into titles they would enter into the contest. And lo and behold, it was the grand winner for 2012. Straight to Xbox, it went in 2013, with releases to PC, Android, and iOS coming the following years. Coverage from some well-respected reviewers in the industry, Total Biscuit, the one I've name-dropped, gave the game credibility, and it was because of TV's video I picked the game up on PC. The mountains. The secret ninja academies train our future Thingla strength. Ancient scrolls told of two buttons which would be pressed repeatedly. Buttons which would be the controls for. A list of other properties I was planning on parodying for this useless tab. <laughs> How are you, gentlemen? All your base are belong to us. You are on the way to destruction. What you say? And of course, the most famous of intros to parody. <laughs> there just isn't anything here, but there's a lampshade expressing that gameplay was the core focus for One Finger Death Punch, so I'll stop wasting your time. 
Okay, I guess I can do one more intro parody. This is as simple as a graphic style can get. Stick figures. But in that simplicity is where a lot of things are stripped away, leaving only two outcomes. Sink or swim. You can either make stick figures balls to the walls hype or baby's first flash animation. No surprises as to what side one figure death punch falls on. I feel that may be a prerequisite to understand how much of a send-up one-figure death punch is to the stick figure medium. If you've never seen something like stick figures on crack or animator versus animation, I highly recommend both to understand the groundwork that's been laid out before one-figure death punch. It is weird of me to both think and state that stick figure animation is an institution, but here we are, I guess. As there is no definition to speak of, hard to have musculature when you're made of sticks, One Finger Death Punch conveys action and motion with snappiness and impact. The action of the title is always breakneck, but never choppy. No matter from which side our stick hero attacks towards or what stance he's adopted for a stage, each attack flows effortlessly into the next with little downtime. And when you see guys' hearts being fisted out of their chest, or eyeballs being knocked straight out of heads, or bones getting cracked with well-placed blows, that impact is well accounted for. There's a surprising amount of violence helping to emphasize this, both from the hand-to-hand -hand combat and when weapons get introduced into the mix, and what's more, each style has its own look and feel. Shaolin Tiger is a straightforward power stance employing little to no fanfare in exchange for a flurry of mauling punches and kicks. Drunken Fist, my favorite of the styles, meanwhile includes a lot of odd movements and bizarre angles of attack to catch opponents off guard. With the weapons, swords adopt a mixture of Chinese sword martial arts, but also fits in a few katana and Japanese-inspired cuts like Iijutsu. Staffs have a split between both Staff Bollocks and Wushu Wankery, so despite both polearms falling into the same category, they feel distinct. Coincidentally enough, my previous statement can be applied to the whole game, as while you don't press anything other than left or right mouse to play one figure death punch, so much individuality went into all the stances that it kinda escapes from me that all I'm pressing is two buttons goes to show you that simplistic doesn't mean a lack in creativity or choosing practicality over style or form or function. I would make the argument that's the core philosophy of any titles, that lacking a major publisher doesn't mean you have to go chintzy or dial back on ideas. If there truly was no creative forethought or backbone to One Finger Death Punch, the round robin of martial arts would have been condensed into one, or there wouldn't have been the effort to make them all stand out and correlate to the various inspirations that the game pays Hallmark to. In all essence, for going with the generic art design of stick figures, One Finger Death Punch couldn't rest on its laurels or half-bake the fighting in any terms. Going back to the weight behind each pummeling our guy could deliver, it leads to a nice little marriage between the presentation and gameplay because the response to hitting a button correctly is a satisfying crunch of a perfectly timed strike. Believe the term is kinetically appealing? 
The goblins in my brain release that sweet, sweet dopamine when I do well because it feels like I'm something out of Ip Man or Hardcore Henry where I'm flawlessly taking out huge groupings of dudes without breaking a sweat or batting an eye. Especially with the brawler enemy type as a perfect combination against them feels like a choreographed fight scene that would make even the best proud of their son. In the same breath, when you do take a hit, all the action comes to a stop to highlight how much of a fuck up you are. It's weird in that while One Finger Death Punch isn't a rhythm game, the way it highlights failure is done the same way like in your Guitar Heroes or Elite Beat Agents. Playing well is like falling into a zen state where you see the inner workings of the universe and know how to direct it. Thus, when you get knocked out, you kind of scramble to get back to that, creating this wonderful ebb and flow facilitated by the duo of the presentation of the gameplay. Without any of what I've said above, One Finger Death Punch wouldn't be able to stand, let alone kick the asses of 100 mooks, because there would be a noticeable off to it. Removing the punchy sound work when slapping dudes around wouldn't make it as pleasing to hit the buttons when you do go on for long combos. Lacking the impact of the hits would make the fighting not as snappy, degrading the quality of the button pushing in the same way that removing the foley work would. Homogenizing the animation quality would diminish the grandeur of the 1 vs 100 idea that One Finger Death Punch has stapled to its chest proudly. Burly brawls are cool because the one has to be quick yet effective to face the hundred, so having sloppy or lazy animation would kill the theme of the game. One Figure Death Punch, as I described it earlier, is a lot like a rhythm game in that presentation is integral to gameplay. You can say that about a plethora of titles, God knows the likes of Silent Hill 2 or Disco Elysium would sound, pun intended awful without their phenomenal presentation bolstering the project as a whole, yet there are other factors hanging around that give a greater purpose to the gameplay, such as story or even gameplay elements, like the inventory management and survival of Silent Hill, or the character leveling in Disco Elysium. For rhythm games or One Finger Death Punch, it is the presentation acting in that role as stripped down, the core for kind titles is simply pressing buttons. And not in the, of course you have to press buttons to play the game way. That's why in parentheses I brought up the gameplay extensions connected to my two examples. But as this is the only thing you do. An electronic version of Simon Says if I wanted to be derogatory. It's an experiment you can do from home. Play any rhythm game muted, then play any other genre with the sound off to compare and contrast. This is getting way into the philosophy talk of game making if you're wondering, as I do be fascinated by the interplay between the components of a video game and how they support or detract from the finished production in these unique ways. Back to the topic at hand, that's why One Finger Death Punch puts its eggs into the presentation basket. It's the left hand to the gameplay's right one. About the only weak part of the game's audio is the music and that's relative. F777 and Shockwave Sound bring some Asian-inspired drum and bass beats to match along the Kung Fu Carnage, but like a good number of video game OSTs, 
It isn't something I would actively seek out. It fits the needs of the game and heights up the action, but I'm not gonna go out of my way to burn this soundtrack onto a CD if you catch the drift I'm sending. But like I said, this is barely a complaint and One Finger Death Punch packs a powerful one inch punch in the form of its presentation. One Finger Death Punch is... Pose. A rhythm game? No, because there's no importance to the music. A 2D brawler? Final Fight in Streets of Rage this ain't making it an outlier. A puzzle game? That you solve with Kung Fu? Restart. I... I think I'll go with what the game says about itself. It's an on-rails brawler. Put that on the back of the box or wait, I bought this digitally. With that roundabout definition out of the way, One Finger Death Punch's difficulty is split off into two sections. Mastery and Speed. Mastery is the basic scale going from student to grand master, so normal to hardest, while time is a bit more elaborate in what it does. For me to delve into the hardness of this Moe's applicable title, we have to get into the barrack essentials, bringing us right up to the boot up screen. Mashed into your head from the word go, only two buttons are needed for one finger death punch. On Steam, it is the left and right mouse buttons. Now, this does change if you're on console, but left and right clicks are it for me. Those are the only two buttons you'll need for the whole game, and it doesn't matter where your cursor is on the screen, except for when it comes to a certain mode that I'll cover in a bit. Starting off, there are two main modes of play, Levels and Survival. Levels is the equivalent of a story mode for One Finger Death Punch, as it contains all the tutorials and introduces new elements of play that'll be dropped straight on top of you if you go immediately into survival. While it seems like survival is the same across all mediums, the game has it split into three separate stylizations, each with their own rules. Short stops with pole position, the trio of survival modes come across the line as such. Survival, blind survival, and no Luca, no survival. Spelled with a C, not a K. That's an entirely different game. Meanwhile, and because I haven't gone to gameplay specifics, thus making any overview of the survival modes incomplete, levels are split three-way by difficulty. Student, Master, and Grandmaster. While this is a sliding scale of hardness applicable to the above most scale, there is that other wrinkle I mentioned seen as I'm now getting to structure. Levels has you journey across a Super Mario World type map, completing stages to unlock new ones as you try to get to the end. Progress is from left to right, meaning you always want to be traveling right as that gets you closer to the end, but there are a few deviations and forks in the road to the final destination that are well worth running down. On the world screen, a selected level will tell you what conditions you will have to fight under. In total, there are 12, 13 if you count survival, configurations of stages. Mob, multi, speed, smash, retro film slash movie, thunderstorm, light save, sword, light sword, nunchaku, defender, dagger, bomb, and boss. Before heading into all those though, the basic layout stays the same across all levels. You spawn in and enemies come from the left and right to beat you up. Thankfully, the screen is split between two halves, the game window and HUD, so you only have to pay attention to what is happening on the top part of the window, as that's where the action is. Uh, to be fair to the bottom, it houses the health bar and keeps track of your score and combo streak. There is even a little play-by-play -play breakdown where you can pinpoint the exact moment your combo rips in half, highlighted in yellow and bold for miss, and red and bold for hit. Hey. Out of all of what I've listed though, you want to pay close attention to what lies below our stick figure hero, the attack window. It is the means by which all is revealed. And by means and all, I mean the attack window is the main form of interaction you have with the enemies. You cannot freely attack a foe when they pop up on screen. 
that'll resort in a miss, and more than likely will have you eating a hit. For most normal stages, this isn't the end of the world as you get 10 hit points, but a few stages have you max out at 4 or even 1, making little mistakes far more worrisome. Instead, when enemies shuffle in from right and left, you have to wait for them to enter the attack window before you click left or right mouse to smack them back into the depths of the void. You can attack an enemy as long as they've stepped into the window, no matter how little or long they've stayed in it, or even if they've left it. I bring this up because attacking in a direction moves you that way, so one finger death punch having this stipulation is so that you aren't punished for accidentally pushing an enemy out of your effective attack range. Speaking of attack ranges, there are a few ways to increase it based on what enemies come at you with, and skills. Central to One Finger Death Punch are the malicious mobs of murderous malcontents. Diversified by color, almost each chop sucky chook. <laughs> Remember that show? Has a number below them and a series of red or blue tags indicating their health value and what button combinations needed to beat them. Standard across the board, Graylings can be batted away in one hit. But like any good hired goon, especially in a kung fu flick, there always seems to be an inexhaustible amount of them. Bolstering the bulk of these nobodies are the color lackeys acting kinda like some bosses. Your Pasquale in Game of Death, or the sword-wielding maniac in Tim Burton's Batman. Thugs who can take a bit of a beating before being put down for good. While they do come in rainbow assortment, as in you have greens, blues, yellows, reds, violets, what unites these skittles are the tags below them. Based on what side they come from is how their tags will be laid out. On the simplest scale, greens and blues have two tags. Greens have two of the same tag based on which side they shuffle from. So if coming from the left, they will have two blue tags and vice versa for the right, two red tags. That means two left or right punches based on which side will take them out. Blues, meanwhile, will switch sides after their first hit, giving you either a red-blue tag or a blue-red tag. From these two mooks do the rest of the enemies build upon, up to the Mahogany and Violet Karatekas, who have four hits, and will switch sides on almost every hit. There is also the question mark enemy, only seen in Master Above, that can be any of the color enemy patterns. Yet, going back up to the top for the menagerie of monsters you'll maul through, this leaves out the brawlers. When you engage a brawler, a little quick time battle happens whose length can be determinate and can only be exited by defeating the brawler. Basically, match the sequence that appears and do so quickly because if you miss an input, whether by speed or misclicking, you take damage. Oh yeah, that little wrinkle I've yet to mention. Speed. The whole of One Finger Death Punch is set to a speed limit which can be seen in most levels at the top left corner. Starting at a base speed of 100 and capping at 250, speed is the level of personal skill the game thinks you're at. Play well and it goes up. Die, drop too many combos, or barely squeak out of a stage and it lowers. That's why the stage reset button is on the top right as a reset won't affect your speed level. For most traditional stages anyway, the Defender series of levels uses a separate timetable. And what makes this game dangerously close to being character action, as yes, the speed system in One Figure Death Punch is akin to God Hand's level system. Playing near or around 250 speed it feels like level die for those that know. This is what makes One Finger Death Punch's difficulty variable in that while the levels have distinct challenges from student to grandmaster, it is performance based. Couple that with stage length and some levels in levels can be nightmarish because you fight around 250 dudes. Don't fret though, there are some advantages at your disposal. In combat, enemies do come in carrying weapons ranging from bows, knives, and bombs to sword stabs and clubs. All the melee weapons extend your attack range a little bit farther out so you can hit enemies sooner for as long as the weapon is durable, as usage will break them over time, while the throwables allow you to hit outside your attack range and kill enemies at a distance, 
one-shotting everyone regardless of what classification they are, though for only one time as ammo is limited and whoever is standing in the way will be hit. Brawlers and the color enemies are prime targets for any ranged attack, but sometimes the dice roll snake eyes. Oh, and getting hit while holding a ranged weapon drops it, so either use them or lose them, as they do stack up on top of each other, from bow to knife to bomb. While melee weapons do break as previously brought up, some cheeky fuckers like to throw them at you, resulting in either a deflect which destroys the item, or a catch which allows you to throw the weapon back. Picking up the same melee weapon type as the one you are currently wielding also allows a throw. These are instant kills as well, though how each weapon throw reacts is based on type. Stabs pinball until three enemies are hit or they go off screen. Swords fly right down whichever lane you chuck them at. And clubs bounce all over the damn place until it too exits stage right or left or hits enough foes to break. Of all the weapons that enemies bring in though, the bouncy ball of death is the best one. When dropped, it will act as a targetable enemy rolling between left and right sides that when hit, will go careening down a path until it smashes into something. If it is the first bounce of the ball, it will fly back if it hits nothing, but this luxury is only afforded at this step, as if it has been used for a kill, it will disappear past the screen. When it beams a dude, it flies back towards you so you can begin the process again, taking out whole swaths of mooks with proper timing. There is no limit to the ball's effectiveness besides timing on your end, as each kill of it makes the ball faster. There are also skills that award you with specific perks upon reaching a certain kill threshold. Things like a screen wipe after 37 kills to always throwing a melee weapon after 18. While you do have to unlock skills by beating the stage locking them, you can freely equip 3 when starting out in student and get 4 points to use after beating the game once and 5 after finishing master. Which finally gets me to stage gimmicks. The white bread of the 12 is mob round. Kill all enemies to beat the stage. That's why I haven't brought up the counter at the top of the screen yet, because based on which gimmick you have, what it records changes. There's not much to say about mob, though it is what the rest of the game is built off of, and that all the survival modes are modified mob rounds. It's also probably the first mode where you will see power hit and a bunch of the other effects that do happen as you play. These are rare instances and slightly change up the flow of battle, like extending out your attack range, getting free hits on enemies for more points or damage, to a pseudo screen clear. Multi is like mob, except you face off against the same set of enemies for four rounds, your health refilling and speed increasing between them. Speed tasks you with defeating all enemies within a time limit, and is the most like a puzzle game one finger death punch gets, as you have to optimize your kills since there's no downtime. Defender, Dagger, and Bomb all need you to deal with every threat without taking damage, either by flinging said ranged weapons at approaching enemies or by deflecting weapons thrown towards you. Light Sword and Nunchaku are modified mob rounds where you one-shot everyone with said weapons and deal with a brawler at the end. Smash needs you to destroy a set amount of background objects by knocking mooks into them. Retro Film and Thunderstorm block off enemy information but are in essence a harder version of mob. And Boss has you deal with one to two opponents that change colors as you fight them. The survival modes, as with the rest of what I've said, are versions of the mob round with added effects. Survival is extended mob. See how long you can survive as kills earn you time in light sword or nunchaku round to regain health. Blind survival removes the attack window, testing your knowledge on spacing and what patterns belong to which color. And no Luka no survival has you play no Luka no while playing one finger death punch. Never played no Luka no? Do you own a cat? Then yes, you have. Oh, uh, you have to move the mouse down to the hand to push Luca off the screen every so often.
For a funny little game with only two buttons, there is a surprising amount of depth when it comes to the skill loadout. There are around 15 skills in total, with the player able to equip 4 after beating the game the first time and 5 after clearing Master, so you can build your stick a robust fighter. Perhaps my favorite combination to use is what I dub Unarmed Master. It involves really only four skills, though you can manage with three if you want, as the fourth and fifth are audibles. The three central skills are throw weapon, gray out, and light em up, with the fourth optional ironically being unarmed master. The idea is quite simple. Throw weapon acts as an early crowd clearer that can boost the kill count to activate gray out and light em up, so you have extended range as every enemy is forced to be gray. You swap out the slightly longer range of using weapons to afford yourself a breather when gray and light are active, as weapons do need associated skills to last longer than what feels like 10 kills. Uh, the weapons are fragile enough that taking the perks that buff them is a necessity if you really want to push them to the limit. I find it better to throw them to disassociate any brawlers and higher tier color enemies from their lives. An Arm Master, the perk, not my fan name for the combination, works as an interim skill for when everything else is on downtime, though the reason for its wishy-washy inclusion is that it does overrule throw weapon, so no one will drop any of the sort besides projectiles. The fifth can be your choosing taking something like Slow Assault to deflate the mob's advance, or Venom Fist so that color moves give you breathing space when gray out is down. Funnily enough, as I continue down skill combinations, placing your faith into your own skill never stops being the prerogative. For as useful as many of the perks are, you still have to earn their activation. They aren't a crutch to rely upon, as you're reliant on foes bringing in weapons and hoping they drop into your attack window, and once a skill deactivates, you have to build up the kills again. That's why I can see someone going for the smaller window skills, as they for the most part stay active for a battle. Attributes like the aforementioned weapons masters for staff, sword, and club, or the increased projectiles for bow, bomb, and knife need only one kill to activate, and their bonuses hit that consistently. Consistency. Triple ranged weapons with something like throw weapon and deep impact basically means that no enemy will ever get the chance to approach you. Archers tend to carry knives, so that's six free kills right there, which is almost half for throw weapon, but a singular kill restocks the projectile perks, allowing you to get back on your bullshit immediately. Then, once the threshold has been passed, Deep Impact clears the screen. For less throwy, more stabby, slicey, or slammy, the trio of Weapon Master perks shafted up with Weapon Rain ensures that your attack range will always be increased and that duplicate weapons picked up will be thrown. I said less, not none. It feels like by the time a sword, staff, or club gives out on you, Weapon Rain drops a payload to get you back in the fight. While somewhat unruly putting them into a build or making them the focus, Freeze and the aforementioned Deep Impact work as filler and skill builds because of their longer downtime. And their lane wiping capabilities, Freeze shutting down the left or right side, and Impact both. They aren't the crown jewel, but a complementary set of stones to it. On the survivability side, Deflect, Gray, and Color work as great alternatives for my Unarmed Master build, switching out Unarmed and the fifth skill, so in that odd occasion of dropping a hit, whether in Gray out or not, you won't take damage because you've built up the kills for both Deflects to activate. Going further, you can substitute Light em Up for Heal, a costly kill count of 99 to return one hit point back so that you have true survivability with the quintet of Throw Weapons, Gray Out, Deflects, and Heal. The possibilities, while not truly endless, are far greater than what you would think for a title costing only a fiver. So with one man's trash is another's treasure, as something like freeze or deep impact can throw off internal rhythm if you don't compensate for their effects. Throw weapon is the same way, many a time I either cheapened its usage accidentally by engaging with a color foe or brawler, chucking the weapons at the wrong alley, or miscounting the number of hits delivered. Thrown clubs, for as hilarious as they are bouncing around like a not too dissimilar ball of death, 
have the jankiest hit boxes in One Finger Death Punch to the point that I could never be sure someone was squashed by it unless the game effects went off. A sucker punch to my combo was the response 25% of the time due to my own misjudgment. That topic on the mind, it never feels like the game tries to pull a fast one on you. The challenge is fair and for the most part entirely self-imposed. Nothing gets dropped on you randomly as each enemy builds upon the last and has the same skeleton so you're never caught in one of those situations. I've probably brought them up in a Showtime reel or two, but for as much as I love character action, there tends to be a plethora of THOSE enemies. Devil May Cry has the awful Fallen in 3 and Annoying Blitz in 4, Metal Gear Rising has the Tanky Mastiffs, and God of War PlayStation 2 the Cowardly Race. Enemies that completely break the flow of combat in one way or another, either due to challenging a specific part of your game you might not have, base or special edition Devil May Cry 3 Fallen without style switching, so you have to fumble bumble with an unleveled gunslinger, or having the most annoying attack pattern that leaves little room for error as you hope to catch that infinitesimally small window of opportunity. Wraith uses Dig! It's super effective. Rafe uses dig. It's super effective. Rafe uses... You get my point. The real shit sandwich is when both are employed. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you, Devil May Cry 4. I always wanted another blitz that I can't attack at my leisure. Gives me barely the length of a gnat's dick to hurt it when vulnerable. Has the health pool of a mini boss. Is hyper aggressive and hits like it doesn't need anchor arms. The cheap way to sunder a blitz is heavily skill intensive as Dante, the hardest character to understand, let alone play as in Devil May Cry 4, while everyone else gets bupkis and has to go their normal route for that big red lightning motherfucker. God, I hate the blitz. But One Finger Death Punch has none of that when it comes to the roster. There's no random slant into fuck off territory for as long as you know what the tags below each foe mean. Any screw up is based on personal mistakes as opposed to poor design. The game tells you what an enemy does, so misstep should theoretically be impossible. So I love the speed system. It recognizes when you should be put pedal to the metal or bees up on the throttle. It's a perfect example of a robust difficulty that was actually tested as opposed to raising some number values here and there and calling it a day. It's odd that the only other game I can think of that takes the approach is God Hand, though the hard mode in that game locks it to level die, which... Well, just watch Mike Cobb for an introductory course on the inner workings of what it means to die. The experience of One Finger Death Punch is curtailed to what you want out of it. Simply passing the time and need a break, the lower speed levels got you covered. Embracing your inner stinko man and demanding a challenge, 200 speed and above is right there if you have the aptitude. It caters to both a casual crowd and hardcore market, a feat relatively hard to accomplish because both parties seek out different forms of enjoyment. Basically, you can show this to your nana, your dad, your cousin, or niece or nephew, and they'd be able to pick up and play and possibly enjoy their time with the game because it doesn't require a huge amount of understanding to wrap heads around mechanics and systems. One Finger Death Punch does more for getting non-players into video games than whatever trite David Cage or Neil Cuckman gaming antichrist produce when they squat in front of their teams and rehash the same old ashamed of being a video game styled interactive movie. Paraphrase from the review that one moviegoer gave about pink flamingos to the news, Silver Dollar Games has their fingers squarely up gamers assholes. It helps that many of the gimmicks you wind up playing through are fun renditions or interesting side grades to mob round. Who doesn't want to chop through half a hundred or more dudes with a lightsaber or laser nunchaku? That's rad as hell and you get to be a badass when you play well. Why I love brawlers to the nth degree is solely because of how masterful it looks when you perfect them, especially at a higher speed where the reaction window is smaller than three seconds. 
This is a game meant for replays or showing off your skill to others like how combo mad vids are. Each version of survival caters to its own degree, and while it isn't hard to pick my favorite, plain Jane Vanilla Survival, Blind and Luca survivals are worth checking out at least once, either because of the true test of skill it delivers, or the wacky execution of having to play two games on screen at once. There just isn't much wrong with One Finger Death Punch, as even with a few of the level gimmicks I dislike, Knife and Bomb punish minor mistakes the most, they are over quickly and don't hamper your main time score as they have their own to use for said levels. Bosses meanwhile catch that mood and vibe of a kung fu flick showdown so well that it's hard not to like them, and with the variability you can make them a one-sided one-on-one, an even duel, or an underdog story which loops back into the aesthetic. An aesthetic one figure Death Punch is happy to carry on its back as it isn't afraid of being cheesy or silly. In another instance of first time critique for the show, outside of the gameplay specific problems I'll get to, my biggest problem with One Finger Death Punch is how it does have a propensity to nuke the eyes out of your head like an aim shot in Fallout 1 and 2. I'm no stranger to including retina searing visuals in my videos. You don't have to look at the screen when those moments come up, as you can let my angelic voice <laughs> guide you. The medium of interaction is either watching or listening, not having to pay attention to what's flying in off screen so you can press a certain button sequence as your eyes get pelted with flashes every few seconds. Fundamentally speaking, I like the concept of the thunderstorm rounds. It and Retro Movie Round remove the safety net of color significance when it comes to brawlers and the side switchers, placing utmost importance on the tags below each fighter in the latter's case and the crowns in the former. Blind Survival does this as well, though it removes everything besides the health and combo HUDs, requiring you to remember what each color enemy does, Though that'll go into my next issue. While RMR and BS <laughs> either go with a CPO overlay to mask what color an attacker is or remove all outside signifiers for their gimmick, Thunderstorm has the eponymous weather pattern hiding approaches from left and right. That means every few seconds, a harsh blast of light will go off, indeed making it easier to see who's sneaking up, but also zapping my ability to see straight out of my head. Akin to an interrogation or accidentally turning on light mode for a web browser. In frankness, that is where most of the unintentional challenge lies within thunderstorm rounds, as they aren't hard, merely frustrating due to the constant bursts, and this is coming from a guy that, to his knowledge, doesn't suffer sensitivity to flashing lights, so I can only imagine what it is like for people who do. What is strange is that Thunderstorm rounds could have easily gone the lights out route where you don't see anything and instead have to rely upon the attack space window to tell who's on what side. If you still wanted to do the lightning effect, you could, but make it intermittent as opposed to constant. At the end of the day, actually knowing who is coming from what side isn't solely based on if you see them or not. I found it easier to simply look at the attack window and react accordingly as opposed to physically watching the left and right sides to see what I have to do. The tags below each threat are the most important information the game gives you, so having the thunderstorm rounds focus on that with a lights out method as a step up from the retro film round where you can still see the foes, just not their color, would make it stand out a bit more and help tie elements together. It goes from you can see what side the enemy approaches on and what their color is in most normal rounds, to still having the ability to see what side they come out of, but now you can't tell their color in RMR, to complete blindness and relying on the attack window in Thunderstorm. This is a constant buildup of scale, ending with blind survival and no Luka no survival, which are the pinnacles of not being able to see what is happening. Cause at the end of the day, I feel that what I've presented goes more along the lines of the usual kung fu training montage or other pieces of media that have the student becoming the master arc. Dodgeball, a true underdog story has it, of foregoing sight and going with instinct to win the day. See Neo throughout the Matrix movies culminating with his blind showdown with Smith in reality. Funnily enough, my other complaint is kind of like a side street to this main boulevard and is dealt strictly to the time period of this game's release. Color plays a big deal in One Finger Death Punch more so than timing or pattern recognition. 
You can see it in my footage for Blind Survival that I struggled to deal with side switching foes because the red and blue tags aren't visible in that mode, which is the intended part of the challenge, like with the missing attack window and lack of number below enemies. But imagine if you're, say, someone with color blindness. Accessibility is a hot button topic in today's gaming headspace, mostly because it gets taken up by people whining about easy modes when that isn't an accessibility issue at all. It's a skill one. So when an actual accessibility issue comes up, it gets batted down the garbage hatch and forgotten about like the gold stinky cheese. That's why I said dealt strictly to the time period of the game's release, as I know I'm digging in years old trash that's been thrown out and compacted as the industry standards have, well, try to be better. But there is something to be said of me as someone who tries to recommend games both new and old to others that might not be accessible to them because of a lack of foresight. And before I continue, that's the key codifier, lack of foresight, uh, Halon's razor, though stupidity I think is too harsh a word in this instance. Unaware? Anyway, and because it seems like One Finger Death Punch 2 fixes this problem, thus strengthening my point about the time period being the culprit of this issue, the colors red and blue are the linchpins for the whole title. No matter the color of the foe, you can always count on the red and blue tags below each to see what reaction they'll take after a hit. Right side will always be red, and left blue. It makes the sturdier foes, both ones that stay to a lane and switch, easier to deal with as you simply memorize the pattern instead of having to apply active thinking power to determine what combination is needed to fight them. That's why blind survival is hard due to needing to remember. This is a constant in all the explanations One Finger Death Punch gives you during tutorials, such as when you start up the game or when a new enemy is added. Without the colors red and blue, you have no shorthand and the whole flow of the game goes out of whack. As a challenge, there is appeal to that, to test your gumption and brain power. That's the intent with something like blind survival. But lacking the ability to see color or see only certain spectrums of color causes One Finger Death Punch to fall apart like some ropey dubbing to a Hong Kong action flick. It is not only beyond possible, but I find it easier to pay closer attention to the attack window because there is no thinking required. You see the pattern red, blue, 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 and your mind immediately goes for the input of right, left, left, left. Looking at the stick figure action is only necessary when judging how close a threat is in a pincer. The whole game is about recognizing sequences, so removing the pattern that tells you what to do is like attempting to bop it without having the toy call out your next action. Blind survival is as close as I'll get to that as someone without color blindness, and even then it's still an unfair comparison as I can inspect and jot down what each color foe does, thus giving me an order of action removed from the tags. As there are no options in any of the menus, if you can't see the color red or blue, or both, or any of the other colors that enemies come in, that's a tough shit you have to squat out and deal with. There's no getting around that. Color, and specifically red and blue, is baked into one finger death punch like how flour, water, and yeast coalesce into dough. Without one, the recipe goes out of whack and the end product becomes too crumbly or doesn't rise. And I don't want someone to have to brute force their way into playing a game because it doesn't take their bodily state into consideration. Color blindness, deafness, what have you. That's unfair to them that they can't play because a developer didn't have the forethought to make sure important game assets weren't discriminating unintentionally. If I may round this segment out as there isn't much else wrong with Punch, I do think that the pacing is a bit poor in the last stretch of the game. You get thrown all these mob rounds that turn into burly brawls of 200 opponents as a massive test of skill at the two-thirds mark, only for the final push to the last fight be a bunch of gimmick stages like Dagger and Defender or Multi and Smash. Stages that aren't hard in the traditional sense since they don't challenge the normal skill set, as the hardest brick of levels happens right before the finale, making the game end with a whimper. Not helping at all is that the final boss is against two guys, in addition added to an earlier boss round, so the final node isn't special besides it being the last one on the world map. It's the only span of the game where I could feel the repetitiveness creep in as time rounds became a staple, but it's a minor gripe if anything compared to my above points.
I'm shocked by how a two-button game can hold my attention well into the double-digit time mark. From the fluid animation and punchy fully work and hit reactions, to the simple-to-pick-up, hard-to-master gameplay that continues to build on top of itself, to the fun experimentation with stage ideas, for the most part, and character abilities, One Finger Death Punch more than surpasses the master in this training arc. <laughs> I think that's something we forget as purveyors of media, the intentions or mindset of the creator. I mean this in the case of sometimes people do want to be a little goofy. Not everything has to be high brow or high art, and I've always been a big proponent of letting an artist have free reign. It's weird that of all the videos I've done, it's the company that's been raked through the mud that understands the simplicity of it all. Anywho, this show is made possible with the likes of the moviegoers within the peanut gallery and inner circle. Consider buying a ticket at patreon.com forward slash let's talk about games, no apostrophe in the let's for behind the scenes access to LTA scripts, thumbnails, other bonus material, your name in the credits, and early screenings of episodes plus the live commentary showtime reels where I ramble my way through games gone by. As said at the top, like, comment, subscribe, share, don't. I ain't your Uncle Iden. And as always, the showing of One Finger Death Punch is over, but stay tuned for our next feature, the next-gen mascots for Insomniac's PlayStation 2 outing, Ratchet and Clank.